Oh, hi! You caught me engaging in the purge. Speaking of purging, I have some bad comics that I need to get out of my system. Let's talk about those. Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your comic sommelier, Chris. I've talked in a lot of previous episodes about creators that I really admire, uh, analyzing their techniques, looking at pieces of comics history that's interesting, but I think we can also learn a lot by looking at bad comics. And it's very hard for a promotional comic to be good. A promotional comic is when a big company hires comics creators or maybe even the publisher themselves to put out a comic designed to make their product or service look good. It's not coming from an especially creative place. It's actually kind of mercenary in how they're hiring comics creators designed to aim a product at their existing audience. So, I'm not a huge fan of them usually, but they can be very amusing. Today, I want to take a look at five comics that I consider the worst of the worst. First up is X-Men teaching you about child molesters, and for some reason, it's sponsored by Blockbuster Video. A creepy pervert moves in on a kid who thinks he could be one of the X-Men because he has a mask and says he has a special mutant power. I'm pretty sure that rape isn't a superpower. I can already tell that these comics are going to be especially tough to get through, so I'm going to numb my mind with the ridiculously powerful Capriccio Bubbly Sangria. This is like 14% alcohol by volume. Let's start numbing ourselves. In a bit of clever symmetry, right after the pervert sneaks up on the kid, Wolverine sneaks up on the pervert. In fact, a bunch of the X-Men are there. Jubilee crouches, ready for action. Cyclops' visor crackles with energy. Beast swings from a tree above. And Storm is also there. Wolverine lifts the pervert high in the air, and we never see him again. He literally disappears in the next panel and is never seen again. I assume if the X-Men, I don't know, beat him up or had him arrested, we'd at least see the reaction from the child that they're talking to. I guess they just let him go instead, because for the rest of the comic, the X-Men just lecture this poor child. The X-Men tell the kid, Terrence, not to trust every adult, including them. Then Jubilee raps with him, telling a personal story about how she once just left the X-Mansion without telling anyone and instantly got lost. An elderly couple offered to help her, but she instead turned to the policeman standing right beside all of them, so the couple sped off. Jubilee assures us that they were creepy crawlers who disappeared like greased lightning. Pitch perfect teenage dialogue. The police officer escorts Jubilee home into the hands of a man in a floating chair and what looks like a werewolf. And now things go right off the rails as Beast tells Terrence about a time when he was using a hologram to disguise himself as a television in the house of a young boy named Jimmy. Jimmy gets a call asking if his parents are home, and Beast leaps into action, telling Jimmy to hang up. Presumably so that Beast himself is not caught, because why is he disguising himself as a television in the house of a young child that's all by himself? We're never told. That's the end of that story. I think we should just put it in the past, move forward, let's look at the time that Batman couldn't solve a crime without the help of OnStar. In this story, Batman has installed OnStar into his Batmobile, but it's never explained how he pays for it without giving away his secret identity. Instead, he uses every feature, which is a hallmark of promotional comics, showing how amazingly useful the product is. Batman uses OnStar to take a hands-free call from the police that the Riddler has just kidnapped Commissioner Gordon. Batman then has OnStar read him his email. From this, he solves a clue as to where the Riddler is and drives off to save Commissioner Gordon. Nowadays, basically every feature available on OnStar you can either get with a new vehicle or at least have access to through your smartphone. So there was a very small window of time when OnStar was especially valuable. But OnStar must have spent a fortune on this marketing blitz because besides just the comic book, they actually also had big budget live action Batman television commercials. 
I remember them at the time. They had the Batmobile from the Tim Burton movies. They had a guy in an amazing Batman suit. They had uh, actor Michael Goff, who played Alfred in the movies, actually appear as Alfred in each of these ads. And the guy that played Batman was nobody, but come on, even though OnStar is paying a fortune, it's not like they're going to hire George Clooney to essentially just put on the cowl and push the OnStar button. It was something else. Batman instantly runs into a massive construction project and asks OnStar to give him new turn-by-turn -turn directions. That's right, this version of the world's greatest detective doesn't keep up with huge city projects or memorize the back roads of his own city. Batman drives to the location he deduces from Riddler's clues and is ambushed by Riddler's henchmen. He lets them think he's knocked off a bridge and uses OnStar to unlock his Batmobile doors and let the henchmen steal it. He then uses OnStar to track his vehicle back to the Riddler's location and jump on the backs of the henchmen. One thing you'll notice is common in a lot of promotional comics is that the violence is toned way, way down. Uh, violence is basically a no-no when Blockbuster or, in this case, OnStar are sponsoring your comic, even though we're talking about things like child molestation and car burglary. No violence, though. Riddler jumps in the Batmobile to escape, but Batman forces him to swerve, and the airbags are deployed. This means OnStar calls Batman to make sure he's okay, but he tells them to just send the police. Literally everything that OnStar does is something that we've seen the Batmobile already be capable of doing. So I don't know who this comic is aimed at. I mean, are kids supposed to read this and then beg their parents to install OnStar in the family vehicle? Or are adults supposed to be reading this comic and just be totally wowed and go like, wow, you know, if OnStar works for Batman, I guess it'll work for me on my commute into work. I don't know. I considered reviewing a Batman comic that endorses Claritin, allergy relief, but you know what? The artwork, first of all, is really good in that comic, and second, the advertising's actually pretty subtle for once. It's a rare occasion where they don't even name Claritin by name. Basically, Robin just gets prescribed an allergy relief medication by his doctor so that he can battle poison ivy. That actually makes sense. Something that makes far less sense is the Avengers teaming up with defense contractor Northrop Grumman. At the 2017 New York Comic Con, Marvel Comics had a giveaway comic that was paid for by Northrop Grumman. The comic pushes the fact that the company employs a lot of scientists in various fields, but doesn't highlight the fact that they're a defense contractor who build a lot of things like missiles for the military with that knowledge which makes them teaming up with the Avengers a little bit problematic because Iron Man is in this story and his entire arc is realizing that the weapons that he manufactures for the military aren't necessarily making the world a better place and he decides to stop manufacturing them. That's his personal arc, but that gets completely ignored here. The story involves the gigantic robot Red Ronin going on a rampage. It's worth noting that the Avengers have defeated Red Ronin on three separate occasions in Avengers issue 199, Solo Avengers 15, and Thunderbolts 15. But this time, they just can't seem to hold it back. Ant-Man enters the robot to shut it down, and Iron Man and Vision hold it back from stomping on a factory, but Captain America calls up N-Gen, the Northrop Grumman Elite Nexus, which is basically four people that get on the phone and tell the Avengers what to do. The comic then launches into some especially dense science discussion, which essentially just amounts to tying up Red Ronin's legs, kind of like that really old movie, The Empire Strikes Back. It's a weird fit for the Avengers. The Avengers are bending over backwards to make Northrop Grumman look cool. One thing I will say this comic does have going for it is it has pretty solid artwork by artist Sean Chen. And speaking of top-level creators working on promotional comics, Let's talk about the time that eBay decided to make a comic book back in 2000. Adventures at eBay was drawn by Judd Winnick, who would go on to write some popular DC comics like Outsiders, Green Arrow, and his run on Batman that brought back Jason Todd as the Red Hood. He got his start drawing cartoony books like Barry Ween. The book was co-written by Jen Van Meter and her husband Greg Rucka. Rucka is very well known for his crime fiction in books like Whiteout, Stumptown, and Detective Comics. 
I'd argue that this comic is not anyone's best work. It begins with an apple jumping next to a laptop and telling you he's the famous eBay Apple Man. I looked it up and I cannot find any other instance of eBay ever using the Apple Man as their mascot, so I'd argue that this story is playing pretty fast and loose with the word famous. The Apple Man talks about how important eBay knows it is to have a complete collection of comics, and how you can easily find whatever you're looking for at ebay.com slash comicsorama, which is no longer a valid URL. Apple Man explains how easy it is to bid and win on a comic book, and has one especially outdated panel where it shows a customer sending regular mail to make their payment for the comic they just won. Who would pay through an easy online portal? That's sci-fi talk! Apple Man then says if you're not convinced, you should read the story of The Collection Eater versus comics o -rama. Collection Eater is the very clever name of a big robot that eats comics collections. Keep in mind, it took two people to write this. A comics reader named Shira has her comics stolen, so she uses eBay to get four different cosplay suits to fight Comics Eater. First she's John Constantine, then a generic anime girl, a mech-suited warrior, and then some sort of knockoff of Witchblade. Each time she gets seriously injured. But then she looks at apparently everyone using comics o -rama and finds someone with the name Cole XN Eater, who likes a generic superhero book. So she dresses up one more time, and the pilot of Collection Eater jumps out to get Shira's autograph, so she knocks him out. Did Collection Eater think that that actually was the superhero that he reads about? Or did he just want the autograph of a cosplayer that was dressed as his favorite character? I don't know. I can't figure that out. I also don't know why he'd want to destroy comics if he himself is a comic book reader. It doesn't make a lot of sense. At least we now know how to use eBay, which, 18 years later, is surprisingly irrelevant and on its way to dying, I think. I think we'd all agree. Uh, anyway, we've read about eBay, we've read about OnStar, we've read about child molesters, we've read about something else that I've already forgotten. Oh yeah, Northrop Grumman. I'm enjoying this drink. Oh, hey, speaking of sangria, which has oranges, let's talk about a comic book where the Avengers are helped by the power of citrus fruit. In the most recent promotional comic I'm sharing with you, the Florida Department of Citrus hired Marvel Comics to promote their new mascot, Captain Citrus. Captain Citrus is a guy named John who works with his family on their family orange orchard. One day, he sees a glowing orange, so instead of calling the CDC, he eats it, and it gives him powers and a new costume, something fruit is known for. In this issue, the Avengers are fighting robots, and the police don't seem to see the chaos. They just can't win until Captain Citrus shows up, and what are his powers? He makes hard light projections like the Green Lantern, except they're colored orange. The second he shows up, Captain America states that Captain Citrus may be the key to winning, and orders the Avengers to follow Citrus's lead. Not that he needs much help, Citrus easily dispatches the robots by charging up Thor's hammer, which makes the robots vanish. He then mentions how he noticed some neighbors had a tarp over some construction. So Captain America says there's no such thing as a coincidence, and it turns out he's right, because it's a massive base run by the supervillain The Leader. The leader catches the heroes, but only Captain Citrus is powerful enough to break free and destroy the weapons from the leader's base. This frees the rest of the Avengers, who quickly arrest the leader. This is so over the top, I'm surprised Captain America does not drop to his knees and beg Captain Citrus to take over as leader of the Avengers. This is the problem with promotional comics. Uh, the existing comic book characters have to bend over backwards to make the product or service look good, and that comes at the expense of the characters that we already know and like. So it frequently feels very annoying to just see this brand new character show up and can already do things better than the Avengers. I mean, how can the world's greatest superhero team get anything done without a guy powered by citrus fruit 
or some scientists that work for a defense contractor, right? I mean, how is it even possible? But that's the problem with uh, promotional comics. I've shown you five of the ones that I consider the worst. I'd be very curious what you would personally consider the worst promotional comic book you've ever read. So that'll do it for this week's episode, but I do have one piece of fan art that I want to share with you. This piece comes from Keith Stowell. It's based on the NFL Super Pro episode I did a while back, and it's hilarious and adorable and I love it. Now Keith actually provided artwork last week and I accidentally said, oh, he's not eligible to win because he already had won. I was wrong. Keith has never won. And so it's really nice that he was the only art this week because that means Keith, you automatically win a Gachapon prize this week. Let's see what I got here. I will get a Gachapon prize out of the Gachapony machine, which is provided by Lunar Shines. If you would like to have your fan art showcased on this channel, I'm having a little trouble because I'm getting pretty buzzed from this Capriccio Sangria. If you would like to have your artwork showcased, as long as it has something to do with my channel, just send it to this address, comictropes at gmail.com. I will feature it. Give me your, uh, your name, if you want, like your screen handle on social media or anything like that shared. Let me know. All right, all right, I'm pulling it out. This is what you get, Keith, uh, something blue. I will shoot that out your way. Congratulations on winning. Thank you for the wonderful art. Thank you all for the tremendous uh, support that I've been receiving. This show is a blast. I've got some big episodes coming up uh, based on creators that I know you'll like. I'm definitely going to be talking about guys like Jim Lee. I'm going to be talking about uh, pretty soon stuff like... Uh, New X-Men, X-Statics, Uncanny X-Force. I'll have basically an X-Month coming up pretty soon. I've got an Aquaman episode coming up. I've got some comic book history that I don't think too many people have touched on before. Uh, I've got some really great stuff that I think you'll be excited for. So please stick around and thank you so much. Until next time, keep reading comics.